Welcome to 2 d Mat, 2D Materials in Tropology. Today with Professor Dr. Diana Berman, who will present to what macroscale superlubricity with 2D materials. And Professor Dr. Max Marian, who will present his talk 2D Maxines to Tailor Friction and Wear, from machine elements and biomedical applications to energy harvesting. Before we start, we want to thank our sponsors for their support. We are sponsored by the two MDPI journals, Codings and Lubricants, as well as Frontiers in Mechanical Engineering and Arctic Instruments. Good morning uh, to everybody and good afternoon for all the people that join us from Europe or from Asia, maybe. Um, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to the next uh, webinar of 2D Mat, uh, 2D Materials in Tribology. Today, it's my pleasure to host this webinar alone because unfortunately, my co host uh, has some family duties uh, to deal with. Um, so, and today we're going to have uh, two exciting talks uh, given by Diana Abermann and Max Marian. Um, we will start uh, first with Diana because there's always ladies first in life. Um, um, just uh, like a few remarks uh, from the last webinar. So I would kindly ask all of the audience to switch off the microphones and the cameras to avoid any kind of connectivity problem. And um, now is already time to invite our first speaker, Diana. Uh, she received her uh, master's and uh, PhD from the North uh, Carolina State University uh, in the United States. Uh, afterwards, she has been a research associate at Argo National Lab. And I think thanks to Diana, uh, as well as Ali Ademir and uh, Annie Sumant, I think Tribology made it in quite high impact uh, because they published the pioneering work uh, related to um, the solid lubrication and lubricant additive work of graphene and nanosheets. Um, so um, that was a really important step to bring back uh, tribology to high impact journals. Uh, and I think uh, until today, we, we really uh, appreciate a lot the efforts that um, they put into this entire topic. So I would like to invite Diana to share her screen. Um, and- uh, Can you see it? Yes, we see it. So we are very much looking forward to what's your talk, which is entitled as towards macroscale superlubricity with 2D materials. Mm -hmm. So we are very much looking forward to your talk, Diana. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, this webinar series. And I hope that you will enjoy the talks today. So today I'm going to try to summarize the work which was done uh, by me and my colleagues at Argonne National Lab and how we actually transitioning this further while I'm now as a professor in mat uh, of material science and engineering at University of North Texas. So with this one, let me start. Um, we all know about these grand challenges of 21st century, and I'm sure that uh, most of you who came to this webinar are aware about the tribology field and specific needs for the tribology. So that was actually a nice paper published in 2012 uh, by one of my colleagues, Ali Erdemir, and his collaborators on looking at the um, energy losses due to the friction just in a simple car engine. And what they specifically, specifically looked at, they try to analyze how much energy which we putting into the uh, gas uh, tank in form of the gasoline is spent for the mechanical energy. And out of this, 
how manage uh, how much energy is actually lost due to the friction so approximately out of these around 15 percent or like around 204 billion kilowatt per year are lost due to the inefficiency of different motor driven systems not only in the car engines but for all other motor driven systems used in the factories used for the airplanes and so on 20% of these losses is actually due to the mechanical losses, such as friction, and that's why it signifies the need for improving the tribological systems and um, improving their efficiency, reducing friction, reduces wear, reducing wear of the materials. And then, if we will just using these estimates reduce the frictional losses by 30 percent this will result in potential energy savings of 2.46 billion kilowatt per year and this is equivalent to 420,000 barrels of oil so just think about like and 30 percent is not a huge decrease it's very small percentage to eliminate the friction so that's why we always continue to look for the better solutions for the more efficient systems for better materials that can work in a wide range of conditions environments and specifically allow us to minimize the uh, wear of the systems so with these new innovations, I needed not only to save energy by reducing the frictional losses, but also to reduce the emission of hazardous waste and uh, actually improve the reliability lifetime of the systems. Why we actually started this whole work on 2D materials in uh, tribology and how to use them in the different tribological systems. It all started actually with graphene and today I will be mostly fine, uh, summarizing the work done on the graphene, but not only graphene, all other 2D materials came into the play, assuming they are very nice, interesting properties, configurations that letting them to be efficient from the tribological point of view. So for example, one of them, flexibility in bonding with so large number of the possible configurations, which we now see into the materials, they can be specifically adjusted for the requirements, for the conditions that we need, for the environment, for the temperature, for the velocity, for the substrate, and so on. They demonstrate, due to this two-dimensional nature, superior mechanical strength that helps to suppress material wear and thus to act as a lubricant. They show like pretty good control over chemical reactivity. So because of this, for example, like graphene or like other 2D materials were demonstrated to have like very nice uh, control and uh, protection properties for the substrates underneath. Because of this, they can work in different environments without much of the damage produced by the reaction with this gas species in the environment or like liquid species. Um, they show this impermeability to liquids and gases. This specific shown, for example, for graphene, which allows us to think that it Characteristics of the materials, we sliding, uh, like rubbing at the different mechanical systems. And then, um, why we actually started this whole work, we started to look for the solution of how we can easily apply these materials to the sliding surfaces. And specifically, we looked at one of the way of dispersing the two-dimensional materials in the carrier solution, which can be easily applied on the surfaces and then reapplied on the surfaces upon the wear when we need to replenish our coating. So if you will compare to any other coatings, which we know like such as PVD, CVD systems, they usually require more complicated way disassembling this whole mechanical assemblies, putting them into the vacuum chambers under high temperature conditions under the plasma that's complicating 
the whole idea of replenishing the solutions and using them for the more robust systems. With easy application idea, we pretty much looked if we can use this as a spray coating, as an injection, um, just to whenever there is the need to replenish them quickly on the sliding surfaces. And thus, the friction can be controlled with these two-dimensional materials depending on the requirements, depending on the needs. What we know about the friction, about the friction energy dissipation, we try to highlight these eight different mechanisms that are usually responsible for the losses we observe in the mechanical systems in the sliding conditions and pretty much generating more friction that you will see. First of all, the wear, whenever we have this change on the surfaces, we need to supply the energy for this to occur. And this energy is lost as a frictional energy. We could have some molecular deformation happening on the surfaces. Again, we need to supply more energy for this to happen. Um, and this could be due to the some compression in the system, such elongation, stretching on the surfaces. So with this one, we specifically also losing the energy. It could be thermal effect. And sometimes actually with the thermal energy provided to the systems, we can affect positively the losses in the friction energy actually minimize them to allow to overcome some potential barriers and to have the easier sliding. It could be some electronic effects due to the uh, generation of electrostatic forces between the sliding pairs that also could be affecting the overall behavior of the system. It could be the formation of the bonds between these two sliding surfaces and in order to break these bonds, we need to provide this additional energy, which is just lost during the sliding. It could be the phonon's mass effect when we have the vibration uh, damping in our surfaces, and this is also dissipated as a friction, or we could be also having some environment chemistry. And when we have the environment species absorbing on the surfaces of our materials and thus also affecting the overall behavior of the sliding systems. And finally, one of the basic concepts that was specifically used for understanding how we can achieve the superlubricity is structural interlocking. Pretty much when you have these good commensurable systems and they have these structures coming together, you have like pretty high friction due to the locking of the systems. If you have mismatch of these two sliding surfaces, that allows to avoid the interlocking and thus to minimize the friction. All these eight mechanisms are really interesting on understanding, but like when you're looking at the terminology, when you're looking at the ways for addressing friction and wear, you need to keep in mind all these different mechanisms, especially if you are going to the superlubricity state on completely eliminating the frictional losses, each of these small mechanisms should be addressed to allow you to reach this desirable state of the almost zero friction of the vanishing friction. So with this one, we actually started looking at the two-dimensional materials and how we can use this concept of minimizing different mechanism of the uh, frictional energy dissipation to, to improve their behavior across the scale. Starting from the nanoscale, when we have this single asperity contact and going all the way to macro scale when multiple asperities working together and providing the more complex system, dynamically changing, completely um, changing the whole view of the frictional systems. And then trying to build this metascopic link, connecting these two different systems from nanoscale to macro scale to understand how we can control this overall behavior of the systems to get the superlubricity with the two dimensional materials. So, um, there was some 
I would say, like number of the public publications looking at the control of the friction in the nanoscale. And the major benefit of this publication was that like at really at nanoscale, when you have only single asperity to worry about, you have better understanding of what is happening there at the contact interface and how we can minimize the friction. So here, for example, uh, some uh, uh, snapshots from one of the studies looking at the graphene in comparison to other systems and specifically showing the super low friction at nanoscale originating from this perfect structure, from the mechanical stability, from intimate stability of the state. Transitioning from this nanoscale up to macro scale, that's where we see lots of the challenges happening because it's not single asperity anymore. So we need to worry about this whole system, about the roughness profile, about what is happening on the surface, how it's changing, because all of us know that with the sliding, with the tribology, we have modifications of the surfaces. So how these modifications on the surfaces affecting overall behavior, that's where we see like lots of the complications coming. So our goal was in all of these studies specifically to understand how we can transition mesoscopically link these two different states, one of understanding what is happening at nanoscale at single asperity, and then going to macro scale to use this knowledge from nanoscale and to build up on it to get this super lubricity state of zero friction regime. But this one, we actually, the first material that was considered for all these kind of application actually came like from the uh, exploration of graphene. And um, if you will think about like some conventional lubricants that require large amounts, produce hazardous waste, dangerous exhaust that needs, or like if you use some coatings, they need probably vacuum or specific environment conditions for the coatings. With graphene, we found that we can actually get benefits in every of these different steps and to improve the behavior of the system, but also eliminate the large amounts needs, um, actually have only these atomically thin structures, protective coatings on the uh, sliding surfaces and use again, very easy way for applying and reapplying these systems. Because of this, it can be actually scalable to all different scales regimes from nanoscale up to macro scale. While, for example, with conventional oil based lubricants, you are not allowed to put them on some like nanoscale regime systems, only going to macro scale. And with this one, we can improve the behavior of all the different geometries without like specifically worrying about how exactly we can code or like protect. Uh, get this uh, graphene towards the sliding interfaces. So we tried like this is kind of like basic comparison of what is happening and to see how it compares for graphene with other materials. For example, like we all know about graphite powder, which was used already like for decades and which is one of the basic lubricants used in like, for example, bike chains, in, uh, uh, in locks, um, with that one, the thing is that because you're using the powder in the form of the large particles, they usually require air in order to provide good enough friction regime. With them, you can reduce the wear approximately by two orders of magnitude in air in comparison to, for example, just unlubricated steel surfaces. And the, if you will try to transition to the dry sliding, graphite powder wouldn't work anymore. There was like lots of the interest in the DLC coating and we're using them in many different systems. With them, you can get actually pretty decent improvement in the friction, in wear, and also receive like, for example, with a hydrogenated DLC, you can receive super lubricity regime, but they only work usually in dry environment whenever you're transitioning to the a uh, humid environment, they wouldn't work. And the major problem with DLC is that you are very limited on what surfaces you can put them because usually it requires sputtering, like iron beam, 
for plasma enhanced CVT in order to deposit TLC. Similarly, with MOS2, it only works in dry environments. With graphene, we demonstrated that we can actually get very thin coating, which can be easily applied and reapplied, and which can work interchangeably good, both in dry and humid environment. And specifically, this is the kind of like summary of the comparison. You can look more at the cited articles to get the better information of what is happening there. But like if comparing the graphene, which is pretty much to the nature of graphite, um, in case of the graphite, you can see that in dry nitrogen environment, it's quickly eliminated from the sliding surfaces and providing the high friction, which is pretty much steel on steel dry sliding regime. In case of humid air, that's what I mentioned for the graphite, you can get this better lubrication stability and they can, uh, graphite allows for the friction to stay at pretty low regime. Uh, without much of the variation in the friction and wear. The major re reason for this is that for the graphite, in order to get this good lubrication, you need to have enough intercalation, intercalation of the water layers to have the smoothening of the surfaces and easier sliding of the graphite flakes. In case of the graphene, what we actually observe that whenever we're transitioning between the humid, dry environment, we can get this like very nice sliding at pretty much the same layer, um, at the same level with the low friction, low wear behavior. And one interesting thing that Whenever we start to observe some wearing of our material, we can easily replenish it by just putting this additional solution process graphene on the surfaces just by drop casting or spraying these materials or like injecting these materials in the system. And it allows us to get this like low slide, a low friction sliding for as long as needed. With this one, it also how it compares in terms of the wear, both in humid air and in dry nitrogen environment, we see significant improvement in the wear protection, in the wear resistance of our surfaces. In this case, it's a four or five orders of magnitude reduction in the wear of the steel surfaces. And then, um, what is interesting that if you look now actually at the SEM image of the graphene covering the steel, it doesn't really require to have this like uniform high quality coating on the surface. It's enough to have just sporadic flakes of graphene on the steel surface in order to demonstrate this very good protection. Another thing you can also see that there are like some overlapping. So these grayish islands are the islands of graphene on the steel substrate. There are like some places where it's darker, where you have lighter. So in some cases you have single layer graphene and some like double layer, triple layer. They also demonstrating pretty high uh, deep peak, which is telling us that we have some levels of the oxidation happening on the edges of the graphene flakes. And the, even with all these uh, sites, all these disadvantages of kind of like, not like perfectness of our graphene coating, it's providing this very nice behavior of very stable, low friction, low wear behavior. We also try to see how we can further improve this behavior and actually find that if we will do the sledding in the hydrogen atmosphere, we can extend this behavior even further because we actually using hydrogen for repairing our systems and providing this more uniform sliding. We try to compare our like sporadic flakes of like, we call it multi-layer graphene, but it's not really multi-layer because you have it only at some places, at some regimes of several layers, multi-layer. We try to compare it to just single layer graphene, which was CVD grown and then transferred on the steel substrate. And with this multi-layer graphene, our uh, behavior, low friction behavior was significantly extended. Why it is happening? Because now with this overlapping of the flakes, they have more mobility during the sliding to rearrange 
and actually to provide this easy shearing of the surfaces. So let me show you how it goes. So here you can see at the bottom, you can see the wear of the systems uh, when they are protected with the graphene surfaces. At the, top, uh, at the top row, you see the wear of unprotected steel. So in case of just bare steel sliding against each other, they generating lots of the corrosion, lots of the oxidation on the surfaces, which you can see from the color changes, from the large wear track size, and from the Raman shift, Raman signature. If we look at the graphene coated surfaces, you can visually really not distinguish which one is graphene coated, which one not graphene coated. But because of these thin layers of graphene, which allowing to rearrange, what they actually providing, they have along the wear track, they start to shear and to reconstruct this whole wear track surfaces and to get this more elongated protection. So with such mobility, with such overlapping, we're actually getting this improvement in the protection due to the rearrangement of the graphene flakes and those providing the more extended wear resistance of the systems because like even if they start to uh, be pushed to the sides of the wear track, they still allowing this to reconstruct. So here you can see the Raman signature inside the wear track. It has like very uniform distribution for the 2D peak or like G peak inside the wear track. And why this happening? Because of the smoothening of the graphene layers providing this more uniform protection. The interesting thing with all of this that graphene really demonstrated this whole ability to work interchangeably good and more like across the different environments. We can further extend its life by um, adding, for example, hydrogen gas or improving this overlaying of the graphene flakes and then also replenishing the graphene coating by adding this graphene solution, graphene-based solution on the surfaces. The thing is that in all of these cases, which I showed you, we didn't really see the superlubricity and all the initial goal for the studies was how we can get to the so desirable regime of the superlubricity of minimizing friction and wear and actually going to almost zero friction values. With that one, actually, it led to this whole new concept of looking, of rechecking this earlier highlighted a different mechanism of the energy dissipation and addressing each of them to get these to minimum losses, frictional losses in between these sliding systems. And how it actually happened, uh, we demonstrated that we can reach to the superlibricity regime using this old carbon ensemble system, using graphene, as we already observed at this, using diamond nanoparticles as kind of like surface separators and allowing us to minimize the area of the contact and then using the diamond-like carbon or DLC to provide this perfectly incommensurable state to avoid any structural interlocking in our systems. With that one, actually we created this new so-called superlubricity solution. If initially in our solution we had only graphene, now we add the diamond nanoparticles to the solution. And you can see this is a schematic of how our system looks like. So there are like some graphene flakes and then there are some diamond nanoparticles in the size of around three, five nanometers in diameter. They are explosion based like round shaped diamond nanoparticles. Um, whenever we drop cast again or spray coat this solution on the surfaces, you can see this coverage. I hope that like you can see some contrast in the image. So the grayish areas is where we see our graphene flakes. And then these white dots are actually diamond nanoparticles on the surfaces. So again, 
if you can observe it from the contrast, the graphene flakes are not covering perfectly uniformly, not protecting all the surfaces. They have this only like patchy island-like structure. Diamond nanoparticles also, they have like pretty good distribution on the surfaces. So we don't really see much of the agglomeration. They have pretty nice uh, coverage of the surfaces. But again, we didn't try here to control what is happening. It was just sprayed on the surface and letting the carrier solution in form of the ethanol just to evaporate from the surface, leaving this coating behind. With that one, when we started testing it, why it actually came to this whole idea of mixing non-alignment and graphene together, uh, when we first tried to just test graphene, our friction was pretty high. When we tried to test just nanodiamonds, the friction was even higher. But combining these two together, that's what led us to get to this desirable regime of the superlubricity. When our friction fall below 0.01, actually we measured like around 0.004. Measuring anything lower was complicated because now we have the problems with the accuracy of the machines. None of the trabometers can give you absolute zero measurements. So you always will have some error in the measurement. So when we reached to this regime, we were like very sure that we are in superlubricity state. Interesting thing that this work only in dry environment didn't really work in the humid. So we're still working on this on how to address the superlubricity. So the same way as just simple graphene, it can behave wonderfully across these different environment conditions. And in the wear analysis, that's what we actually observed in the case of the dry environment for our graphene plus diamond solution, the wear was like almost indetectable. This is the wear track analysis. So you see that there is kind of like just some oscillations due to the roughness profile. In case of the ball counterpart, we see some compression, which is pretty much used by the um, hertz and contact pressure when you applying the loads during the sliding. So this is not like really the actual wear of the surfaces, but rather the changes in the surface due to the uh, applied load. And then in contrast, in case of the humid environment, we've seen like pretty decent change in the wear. We actually observe like lots of the material transfer from the ball side to the flat. And then we see like this huge wear scar on the ball side. So the bottom one is the ball in both of the cases. And you can see that if in this case, we couldn't really measure the wear here. The wear volume was pretty large and consistent. What was happening to really understand what is happening behind this, when we started to analyze our surfaces inside the wear track, and this was actually by collecting the wear debris from the wear track and looking at them using the transmission electron microscopy, what we actually observed that our all wear debris having like very interesting structure. They have these diamond lattice surrounded by the more graphitic shells of the materials. And this was happening like everywhere to really demonstrate. So by going out and in focus, we try to understand how exactly they look like. So inside the focus, if we focus good enough, we seeing this diamond lattice. If we're staying a little more out of focus, we're seeing only these graphitic shells. So what it actually showed that all our wear debris, they're having some kind of like structure similar to this one when you have diamond nanoparticle surrounded by the graphitic shell, kind of like in form of the carpet on our surface. And if we look closer to the systems by playing with the focus of our systems, we've seen that this is happening in pretty much everywhere. So even here, if you see initially just the graphene flakes, if you will start to focus further, you will see these diamond lattice inside the structures. So with such, it actually gave us, the, gave us the conclusion that probably these unique structures which we found in our wear tracks in form of the diamond lattice surrounded by graphene, uh, 
is the uh, whole reasoning for observing the superlubricity. To look at this, we actually ran some molecular dynamic simulations, and you can see, I hope that video actually shows you what is happening. So it will be running now again. What we actually observed, this was our initial configuration. We have these graphene flakes, we have diamond particles. During the sliding, due to the existence of the dangling bonds on the diamond surface, as well on the edges of the graphene flakes, we have like this kind of like initial backring and attachment of the, gra uh, of the graphene edges to the diamond particle. So if at zero nanosecond we have just patch, then it starts to attach to diamond, and then it actually wraps around the diamond nanoparticle. Once it happens, what is actually occurring is that we completely covered any reactive sites of our diamond nanoparticle with graphene, because now our graphene shows this non-reactivity, pretty good configuration. And we producing the separation of the surfaces, like using the small ball bearings, graphene diamond based ball bearings. With such, our coefficient of friction, if it initially was in the higher range regime of around 0 0.2, 0 0.4, it immediately drops to the superlubricity values. So here you can see actually it oscillates around 0, 0 0.01. That's our superlubricity regime. Once we did this, okay, we observe it happening just for the single flake, but what will be actually happening because we are again in macro scale regime, we have many systems, we have like these graphene diamonds, like uh, just distributed on the surfaces, so we ran this mesoscale simulation, and what we observed that Actually, many graphene flakes combined are combined in diamond nanoparticles in such a way, creating these diamond bearings. The interesting thing about these is that not all of them combined. You can still see some of the graphene patches happening here. You still see like uncoated diamond nanoparticles, but just this reduction, which we observe, and usually the reduction about like 65%, so around 65% of our existing diamond plus graphene systems are combining together to produce these uh, ball bearing systems. 65% of this reduction helped us actually to go to the superlubricity regime. So if initially during the zero simulation time, most of our frictional system were like in this state, in unscrolled state of coefficient of friction of 0.7, with simulation time, we had more and more systems combining together and getting to this final configuration of zero, super, of zero uh, coefficient of friction or like final configuration of the superlubricity. Um, with that one, Actually, it allowed us to discover this whole superlubricity regime to understand what is happening there, how it can be achieved. So now we came to this whole uh, question about will it work with other materials? And one of the things we tried, what if we will start replacing our system? So we're still searching to look at the best conditions at the best materials configuration to work at the different environments, at the different temperature, at the different sliding regimes. So first thing we replaced actually our graphene with molybdenum disulfide, leaving other systems the same in our configuration and pretty much using the same concept of distributing our MOS2 flakes with diamond on the surface and sliding against the DLC surface. What we actually observed that the frictional behavior was very similar. It initially was at a little higher level. There was some interesting spike happening, but then it immediately dropped to the coefficient friction below 0 0.01 regime, which is considered to be superlubricity. The surfaces again were not like damaged, were pretty much showing no wear. And this is how the a uh, flat substrate looks like. So here we see a little discoloration happening due to the 
uh, we are provided through arrangement in the system. But if you look at this, uh, even with this discoloration, we didn't really see much of the changes inside the wear track in terms of the roughness profile. Um, so it came to the question, could it be that our MOS2 works very similarly as graphene? So is it the same mechanism? How we should really look at this more closer to understand what is there inside the wet track? We started looking at the Raman signature of what is happening and specifically we're interested about these spikes we see initially in the friction, so how it modified. So if initially we've seen inside our wear track molybdenum disulfide peaks, you can see, and there is like no carbon G peak really existing here. I, I mean like 2D map of carbon G peak showing, but we don't see any 2D peak of our system because we don't have now graphene in on our surfaces. It's only diamond nanoparticles which producing this G and T peak. With time, with prolonged sliding, actually the molybdenum disulfide peak disappeared from the wear track. Instead, we start to observe this 2D peak inside our wear track and showing this high contrast inside the wear track. When we looked across the wear track using the TOF-SIMS analysis, we actually observed the changes in the S2P intensity and molycarbide peak intensity inside the wear track. So these uh, peaks demonstrated higher intensity inside the wear track in comparison to outside the wear track, which came, which led us to the conclusion So actually during the sliding, we are getting some changes like uh, trouble chemical changes inside the wear track that allow us to get to the super lubricity regime. We looked again, we went to the TM analysis of our systems and what we actually observed, if initially just like pretty much in the beginning of sliding, like after 50 cycles, when we stopped the test, our system was pretty much consistent from diamond nanoparticles and MOS2 flakes. So you see this diamond lattice, somehow the contrast doesn't show like as nicely, but we see these diamond lattices and we see these like large spacing of the MOS2 flakes. When we continue sliding and stop the test at 100 cycles, actually the nature of the wear track is changing. We see this still some MOS2 flakes, but they start to provide this curvature. They are thinning. So here we have like up to 10 flakes combined together. Here we have only like three, four at different places. They also rapturing. So we don't see as long flakes anymore. And they kind of like starting to surround these, like trying to surround the diamond curvature. With even prolonged sliding at 300 degrees, uh, 300 cycles, um, we don't see anymore so many thick layers of MS2, only pretty much like single layer curvatures of MS2, and again, these like diamond lattices. But then after this spike, actually what is happening, and it was very challenging to stop here. We don't really observe this like intermediate state. Once we rupture these flakes, it looks like they immediately convert into these onion-like carbon structures. You see these like they're pretty large in size, around 30, 40 nanometers in diameter. And they're demonstrating this like very nice alignment of the graphitic shells. We looked at the simulations, molecular dynamics to simulations to really understand what was happening and what we observed that during the sliding upon this friction generated heat and load, we actually observed the rupturing of MS2. And you can see that once it ruptures, it happens pretty much immediately. And like all the MS2 is dissociated into the moly and sulfur. Both moly and sulfur attach to our diamond nanoparticles and starting to disintegrate the diamond nanoparticles. 
So here you can see the yellow atoms are sulfur blue moly. So we try to understand what is happening once this moly and sulfur attach to the surface. What they lead to, sulfur atoms actually immediately start to amorphize the diamond nanoparticles, uh, actually uh, eliminating the lattice of diamond and creating this more amorphous carbon structure. And once we create the amorphous carbon structure and release the contact stresses, it reintegrates, it reconstructs into more annular carbon structures. So let me show you quickly this simulation of what is happening. So we're looking at this, like again, at the mesoscale regime of trying to understand what is happening. So once we get this amorphization of carbon, it's works with sulfur and rearranges into the more stable anion-like carbon structures, the ones which we observe in, in TM systems. With that one, we actually started thinking, so why we would need such a complicated process for creating this system? Why won't just take small anion-like carbon materials, which you can purchase from the vendors, the problem is that with these OLCs, usually you're limited in the size, only like up to approximately like 10 nanometers, uh, the way how they are produced by amorphizing the diamond nanoparticles directly and creating these larger shells. When we looked at them, they didn't really provide the, uh, the super lubricity regime. The friction was of the higher regime. But the major difference, why it was happening, that in that case, the uh, onion like carbon structures were small. In our case, they were like really big. Why it was happening? Because now we have these agglomerates of diamond combined together and reconstructing to create the more favorable conditions. The major reasoning for this was that actually with the increased number of the uh, layers, we improving the mechanical properties of our systems. And if initially the maximum load they can withstand is very low, they start to rupture back and actually not provide the separation of the surfaces needed for the super lubricity regime. For the higher number of the layers, we have much higher stability of the system and they can sustain much higher loads and pretty much work the same way as we've seen for graphene plus diamonds, separating our sliding surface, acting as a ball bearings to reduce the friction and wear and get to the super lubricity regime. With that one, by that's why we're receiving the super lubricity regime of like coefficient of friction falling below 0 0.005. So what it actually gave us that our tribal test create favorable conditions for uh, material reconstruction and adaptation and transformation inside the wet tracks. Keeping this in mind, we are trying now to look more at how we can use this concept of adaptation, reconstruction of the materials to work more uniformly across the environments to be as good as just we observe for graphene and to provide this super lubricity regime state. What we actually did, we tried to look at the high temperature applications and look at the adaptation of the materials um, by combining these different materials together, different two dimensional systems. So we know about graphene working nicely at the humid environment, at the dry environment, um, but still staying at the higher coefficient of friction of 0.1 approximately. But we also know that MOS2 itself, or like WS2, can get us to the lower coefficient of friction regimes so of like 0 0.01, 0 0.03, when we're going to the dry vacuum or like higher temperature conditions. So using this concept, what we actually try to look, what if we will combine these two dimensions materials together to get to this adaptation state so that they can reconstruct and provide the super lubricity sliding. These are the recent studies we've been working on, on combining this graphene and the moisture together and creating so-called chameleon coating, which with the high temperature regime was showing us actually reduction, not to super lubricity, but very, very close to 0 0.02 
coefficient of friction and thus significantly minimizing the wear of the sliding surfaces. So now by trying to recombine this with additional materials, we're trying to stay at this superlubricity across the different environments, across the temperature when switching from low temperature to high temperature, when switching from the humid to dry environment and to get this like very nice tropological behavior. At the same time, we're looking at this concept of the in-situ generation of the lubricating film and how we can use gas, liquid, different solid sources of carbon, the same way as we observe for MS2 plus diamond, when diamond play the role of the carbon source to reconstruct the more favorable solid carbon lubricant conditions. So how we can use this whole dry uh, sliding system when we have the stress and temperature assisting the materials reconstruction to get this better tribological behavior. And with this one, actually to receive these tribological systems that can give us like carbon-based systems that can get us to the superlubricity state across these various conditions. So for example, one in one of the recent studies, which we just published last year in 2021, we use the copper as the catalytic metal to provide this reconstruction of the materials from the decaying, dodecane, or hexadecane environment and get, and get the protection of the surfaces. In this case, the coefficient of friction wasn't really dropping to the superlubricity, but what we've been able to get is to drop to the uh, like, a zero wear regime because now what we actually uh, were receiving is that our uh, wear track is completely replenished and uh, constantly reconstructed by using these hydrocarbons provided from the environment. So here you can see the wear track for the addition of decaying, dodecane, like hexadecane, whenever we're sliding across all the different environments. And now we also see similar behavior in uh, different systems such as oil, such as ethanol, such as methanol, such as uh, 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 kerosene, gasoline. So all the different, whatever is hydrocarbon source we can get, it helps us actually to reduce significantly the wear of the systems and to constantly protect the surfaces. What is happening is that our surface reacts upon the sliding with the surrounding um, uh, environment and reconstruct this carbon-based tribofilm, which allows to significantly reduce the wear of the systems. So with that one, I just would like to end my talk and to quickly summarize that uh, we observed the superlubricity with the two dimensional material. There is like still lots of the potential for looking at these materials and adapting them depending on the conditions, depending on the environment requirements, depending on the sliding regimes, which can give us like lots of the potential applicability of these materials. And I would like to acknowledge my students at UNT, my collaborators at Argo National Lab and additional collaborators from uh, different universities and companies who helped for this work to start and to continue and uh, be like uh, showing like so much impact to the tribology field. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Diana, for the very nice um, and comprehensive talk and giving like a, a short review of all the things that you have been doing uh, about graphene and um, other 2D materials. Um, so um, I would like to use this opportunity because there have already been two short questions popped up in the chat. Um, which the first one is according to the second law of thermodynamics, the heat loss uh, to the sink is a natural process. Uh, if we reduce friction and then it may have other mechanisms to release the heat of the sink, how can we define the overall tribological behavior related to the second law of thermodynamics? Mm -hmm. um, 
Mm, you are talking about the heat losses uh, upon the generating the heat first. The origin for this generation of the heating and the local temperature increase is actually due to the friction. So it's all interconnected process. So how we generating this local heating is due to the rubbing, due to the high friction, this frictional energy is released in terms of the temperature increase. So, and then it is dissipated, for example, by using the heat sink, either the surfaces, uh, which providing the pretty good thermal conductivity to dissipate this, or either by the environment. So whenever we have some liquid lubricants that allow to eliminate. So if from the beginning, we're not generating the heating by immediately reducing the friction and staying at the 0.01, like below regime, we're not really creating much of the heat to work about and that's why it is so interesting because usually the temperature increase due to the heating is a huge problem that requires additional ways for the eliminating these uh, high temperature spikes so uh, in addition to just minimizing the frictional losses from the efficiency perspective we're also minimizing the whole uh, friction, uh, the whole heating and damage produced to the surfaces by the heating. I hope that it kind of like answers the questions if I understand it correctly. And with the second question, what solvent did we use? We use ethanol solvent. Why mm -hmm. are we using it? Because it allows us to quickly evaporate from the surface. Yep. So by mixing our graphene or MS2 or like diamond solutions, like the super lubricity solutions with ethanol, we are afterwards spraying it on the surface of interest and that allows to eliminate. So either like in the sample preparation, we just putting this on the heating plate to remove any of the ethanol contamination on the surface. Or like, for example, during the sledding, whenever we just spray very small amounts, it's immediately pretty much like within the couple seconds it evaporate from the surface. So those spikes, which were observed, like if you, uh, in some of the just graphene sliding, they were originating from the, uh, so you see some here, the spikes, this is actually originating due to the addition of ethanol mm. and how quickly it evaporates from the surface. Right. Yeah, ethanol is mostly a, a very nice compromise of the simple solvent mm -hmm. for this kind of process. Yes, ethanol is the best and like it's pretty safe. Yes, yes, yes. A, a they, certain time, right? People, so like for, for several, yeah, there is another question, materials colloidally stable mm -hmm. in ethanol. Um, we did the ultrasonication initially when making it. Uh, when making the solution, but afterwards it doesn't really require to get this ultrasonication uh, be before like every test. Right. Um, and then I got one more question uh, asking, uh, could you tell if the nano diamonds is distributed randomly over the surface or there is some sort of order? No, mm -hmm. that's why I showed you uh, SEM images of the surfaces, they are like very randomly distributed. You can see this. I hope that it's providing like good enough magnification, but you can see that somewhere there are kind of like little agglomerates at some places there are just diamond nanoparticles alone. So here, for example, they are kind of like some uh, clusters. So we don't really, that's the whole beauty of this uh, approach of spraying on the surface that we, from the beginning, when we're developing this, we try to make sure that we don't need to worry about this perfectness, about the specific environment conditions for the deposition, because otherwise uh, you are not really seeing the benefit in comparison to the providing just PVD or like CVD coating on the surface. So by spraying and like not really controlling what is happening on the surface, it was enough to produce the super lubricity regime. And that's why the system is specifically so interesting that it's during the sliding itself adapts, self-rotates to create this better configuration for the tribological systems. 
Yes, we are interested actually in testing vaccines also for the substitution of the graphene. That's why I'm saying that there are like so many different systems, so many different configurations of the materials that can work. With vaccines as well, there are so many vaccines, so it's not only... The nice thing about graphene was that it's only kind of like one type, one graphene, especially like if you don't want to test any graphene oxides then like you have only one material and you work with it and then like you are sure what you have in the system with maxines as well that's what we are now collaborating with andres we're trying to uh combine different maxines and to see how we can get like better tribological behavior of the systems but like there are also like different vaccines configurations and so what exactly are you just using vaccine alone are you trying to combine it with something else and how it would be affecting the overall behavior of the materials and the construction of the materials that's where like lots of the open questions are yes I believe there are more open questions that uh, things that are already known about vaccines. So, and that's the yes. nice thing um, that there's so many, so much space uh, to explore things in tribology and vaccines. So, I think everybody that wishes to do something, the community will greatly appreciate more effort towards mm -hmm. vaccine tribology. Yes. Excellent. So, um, thank you very much uh, for this short question QA round. Um, so um, in this moment, I would like to uh, invite um, our second speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Max Marian, um, to share his screen. Uh, I, I would say Max is maybe the, the, the rising star in tribology uh, right now, nowadays. Uh, he has a very broad interest uh, in, in tribology. So he deals with artificial intelligence, numerical simulations, uh, vaccines, uh, Biotribological uh, properties. Uh, he has been recently appointed as a professor uh, very close by here uh, at the other uh, competition uh, in Chile at the uh, Catholic University. But I'm very happy to have him here uh, close by um, to push a little bit uh, the overall topic tribology uh, in, a, in a local context. So the title of his talk is 2D Maxines to Tailor Friction Wear. Uh, it fits very well with the last uh, question that we have seen. Uh, so we are very much looking forward to your talk. Um, and the uh, stage is up to you, Max. Yes, thanks, Andreas, for the, for the nice words. And uh, thanks, Diana, for your, your excellent and, and very interesting presentation. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Andreas and, and also Philip, if you're watching the, the recording afterwards, uh, for inviting me uh, to speak in, in this excellent webinar series. And thank you all in the audience for, for joining today. It's my pleasure to talk a bit about some tribological applications of 2D vaccines. So since there have already been some, some talks on vaccines and their amazing mechanical and tribological properties and also in this webinar series from a more fundamental point of view, I will put my spotlight of this presentation on some specific applications ranging from machine elements such as rolling bearings over biomedical applications up to uh, energy harvesting. And for each of these areas, I will um, provide a, a short motivation why it is necessary to, to talk about these topics. And also, um, I will show you some, some of our results and findings. And also part of the things I'm going uh, to show you are fresh, fresh from the lab and uh, still topic of ongoing research. And of course, I, I do not work on, on these aspects alone, but this has been done in, in a good international collaboration with colleagues from the University of Erlangen and, and Bayreuth in Germany, the Universidad de Chile, together with Andreas, we're doing a lot of work, uh, Purdue University in the US, and also, of course, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So let's start with uh, machine elements. Um, solid lubricants are generally used when highly stressed machine elements such as rolling bearings, sliding bearings or, or gears cannot be lubricated with conventional oils or greases due to extreme ambient conditions. So this is illustrated here as an example, for example, for the, the bearings in uh, X-ray uh, tube rotary anodes or uh, turbines, uh, rovers uh, for space exploration, satellites, pumps, uh, or uh, carriers for high temperature ovens, for example. So this includes applications with very high or low temperatures, vacuum, radiation, or um, quite high requirements and 
in terms of cleanliness and uh, environmental friendliness. Uh, so pretty much everything we can also sub sum under the term green tribology. And 2D materials, uh, as um, Diana already introduced to us, are particularly suitable for uh, lubrication of these um, kind of applications um, because of the high mechanical stability of the 2D materials, which is an extremely important property in order to withstand the uh, mechanical tribological stresses in, in tribal system and thus also to protect the, the underlying surfaces from, from wearing. So this is exactly the, the purpose of solid lubricants and the two need nature also provides good conformality um, um, and good adhesion to the to the underlying substrates, uh, even with with higher roughness, for example. Another plus is the interpermeability of liquids and even even gases, which can, for example, limit the penetration of liquids under under uh, solid lubricant. Um, and reduce also the influence of envir environmental conditions on the tribological behavior. And yeah, a further important quality of, of multi-layer 2D materials uh, that contributes to their good lubricity is the low shear resistance, resistance between the, the individual layers of the material. So overall, uh, we can consider 2D materials as excellent candidates for solid lubrication of highly stressed machine components, as we saw on the previous slide. Which 2D materials do we know or which have been used in, uh, in tribology so far? So firstly, of course, uh, as we just saw in the previous presentation from Diana, graphene, uh, but also all its derivatives uh, like functionalized, hydrogenated, fluorinated, um, graphene, graphene oxide, reduced graphene oxide, and so on. A lot of research has also been done on transition metal decalconicanides uh, like or with um, molybdenum disulfide or tungsten disulfide being the the most prominent members. Um, some work has already been done uh, for, for the two former of uh, in, the, in the context of rolling bearing applications, uh, mainly driven by, by space exploration. Uh, then there's also hexagonal boron nitride, HBN. And uh, lastly, we have uh, transition metal carbides, nitrides, and carbon nitrides, which are also known under the name Maxines. So the letter appeared for the first time in the context of tribology a few years ago. Um, Maxines are, so to speak, one of the youngest members of, of the family of 2D materials and were first uh, discovered by Lugazzi and co-workers in 2011. Uh, since then, uh, work has primarily focused on uh, the synthesis of Maxines as well as applications in energy, catalysis or electronics. Uh, Maxines are denoted by uh, the general formula M n plus 1 X and Tx, where M stands for n plus 1 layers of an early transition metal um, from the groups uh, 3 to 5 in the 3D to 5D block of the periodic table. Xn stands for uh, layers of carbon, nitrogen, or a mixture of both, and Tx for the variety of surface terminations. The most prominent representative uh, of Maxines is uh, TI3C2TX. Uh, and yeah, currently some, some works are addressing the, the fundamental tropological behavior of Maxines as fillers and composites, as a lubricant additive, or as a solid lubricant. Um, so far, this has mainly focused on titanium-based Maxines and also mostly on uh, tropological experiments on the fundamental model level. Uh, but how Maxines can be transferred to the macro scale and more application oriented conditions with complex geometry and stress, or stress collectives has rarely been, been studied so far. So when thinking about testing in an application oriented context, we also have to think about possibilities, how to produce the two MIDI materials, how to synthesize them and how to deposit them on our components. <clears throat> For example, like uh, bearing rings. So this, <clears throat> this slide um, shows different processes and, and the color coding of the errors assigns the different 2D materials to the possible or so far uh, researched uh, deposition processes. And regarding Maxines, um, so they have to be synthesized from max phase by liquid phase exfoliation, and which will I show in a moment. And then they can be deposited on the component uh, using relatively simple methods like, for example, drop casting or maybe spin coating or some advanced techniques like spray coating or electrophoretic deposition. So how do we synthesize the Maxines? How do we get 
uh, them in a way that we can actually apply them or, for example, drop cast them on, onto our component surfaces. The whole process starts with a metallic max phase in the form of a powder. I, for example, layer hexagonal carbides and nitrites. Uh, in our case, titanium, aluminum, and, and carbon. And when we add uh, hydrofluoric acid and mix this for some time, um, we can we can etch out the the aluminium layer, uh, or selectively etch out the aluminium layer out of the max phase, leaving only the M and the X. Hence uh, the name maxines. And in our case, this would be, for example, Ti three uh, C two. And due to the selective etching, uh, we also get so-called surface terminations uh, are formed. Uh, by the elements, elements from the from the acid, uh, the water or the air at the free ends of the of the sheet. Here we some, see some results from material characterization of um, fabricated maxine nanosheets and, and coatings. So on the right uh, are HR tem images where we can observe the this regular and multi-layer character of the nanosheets um, with the um, below we see uh, some some SEM images after of the coating with the drop casting. On the left is the uh, surface from above, and on the right hand side we can see some uh, focused eye beam milled uh, cross sections. Um, there we see that that the maxine layer deposited on the on the substrates uh, consists mainly of multi-layer nanoparticles or nano sheets, where we can also observe this characteristic accordion-like structure. The key message from the uh, EDX results in the, in the four images on the top left is that basically there is, is uh, titanium and carbon in particular. And furthermore, we can see uh, fluorine and oxygen. Um, so these are the so-called okay. surface terminations of the Maxine nanosheets, which can also be confirmed very nicely by Rama spectroscopy. So uh, we have basically OH, F and O terminations. And last but not least, uh, we can also see from TBD MS that there is still some intercalated water between the nanosheets, also as a result of uh, the synthesis process. So, what we did were some tribological measurements on the component level uh, using this kind of thrust ball bearings. So, basically, the uh, ball, uh, the bearing consisted of balls, a sheet metal cage, and two bearing washers. The upper washer was uh, driven while the lower washer was stationary and the wall system was mounted into a Watsau tribometer uh, under what was operated under atmospheric conditions. Um, and the upper washer was driven with an electric motor at uh, 1000 RPM and we applied a load of uh, 130 Newton. On the left, we see some photos of, of the real bearings. Um, so initially we tested uncoating bearings for as a reference and also bearings with a magazine coated raceway. And in the test, neither the balls nor the cage were, were actually coated. Because the comparison only with uncoated bearings is not overly meaningful because no one would actually operate uh, the bearing in such a way, we wanted to compare the maxines also to other more established uh, solid lubricant coatings produced by large scale deposition processes. Um, so we, here we can see um, images of the surface and in the FIP cross section, some MediaX line scans and Raman signals of three studied reference systems. Basically, it was one coating consisting of hydrogenated, um, uh, of, of tungsten doped hydrogenated containers of amorphous carbon, one undoped DLC coating from the uh, DNG bands from the Raman spectra on the right. Uh, we can see that the pure DLC coating has a more like graphite like structure. And finally, we also used uh, MOS2 coating as a reference with the uh, pretty classical surface properties and, and structures. Let's have a look at some of the testing results. Um, the uncoated reference is always shown in gray. Um, the uh, hydrogenated tungsten top coating in orange, the pure DLC in uh, yellow, the MOS2 in blue, and the maxine coated um, bearings are shown in green. So basically, um, the end of the surface life of the bearings in our um, in our experiments uh, was defined until like a frictional torque of more than 0.5 newton meter was reached, um, and after that um, it came to a fatal uh, failure and the tribometer shutdown. Um, this was result mainly of because of cage malfunction and combination with uh, blocking balls and hot running of of the bearings. So we can see that. 
uh, the frictional torque during the surface life, during the stable operation of, um, of the bearing, um, of the reference bearing was somewhat higher, um, but the remaining solid lubricants did not really show much difference, uh, especially given the scatter. However, we were able to see um, that the difference in the surface life, which is defined as the number of overruns in which the bearing can be used, were much more pronounced. So all, all the coatings substantially increased the service life. Uh, the two DLC coatings by roughly a factor of 1.8, MOS2 by roughly a, a factor of uh, 2.1, and the Maxines by a factor of uh, 2.7 compared uh, to the reference. So that means that the service life of the Maxine coated bearing was roughly 30% longer than that of the MS2 and 55% longer than that of the DLC coatings. We can also observe that the gravimetric uh, wear of the washes was reduced by up to 94% compared uh, to, the, to the references, which was in a similar range uh, to, to the DLC and even better than the MS2. So we wondered why the service life was higher than that of the uh, reference solid lubricants. And here we can see some light microscopic images of the raceway on the bowl and the cage. And on the raceway, we can see um, this kind of Maxine layer, probably some compacted form uh, with yeah, partially intact, partially worn areas. Um, but the clue is that we also found such dark spots on the balls and on the cage. Also, we are only, as you remember, we only had coated uh, the raceways. And the Raman uh, images uh, on, on the areas marked with uh, cross, uh, crosses uh, showed also that there were indeed some, some transfer of Maxine-like material. So this might not be classical TI3C2, maybe a bit degraded form intermixed with nanocrystalline amorphous oxide structures from iron, uh, iron oxide from the substrate, uh, some titanium oxide, um, which, which might be due to uh, the mechanical shear stress, um, oxidation as a result also of the flash temperatures and, and the hot run. So basically, uh, what the, the mechanism we, we came up with is that we have a compacted Maxine layer on the, on the raceway, which is the primary and highest loaded contact of this rolling bearing, uh, which is, yeah, it gets compacted due to constant uh, overrolling, but also we get a kind of a transfer to secondary uh, contacts of the rolling bearing, for example, the contact between the ball and the cage. And since we know that the cage is a main cause of bearing failure in, in the disoperating conditions, one can imagine that this of course, quite, quite beneficial to extend the service life of uh, the bearings. So much about the application and context of machine elements, such as rolling bearings. And next, I would like to, to talk a bit about the usage of uh, or in biomedical applications. And basically, um, numerical, um, uh, numerous medical uh, devices are employed to treat uh, various diseases and injuries and support physical pro uh, physiological processes. And thereby the, the effectiveness and the safety is a major concern to actually get into uh, clinical application. And since all medical devices, someone at some point inevitably contact and interact with the human body, um, is why they're like the surface and the interfaces are very important. So this is illustrated here in this figure. So this covers, for example, dent dental implants, um, contact lenses, um, yeah, catheter stands, bone fixation devices, or for example, um, load bearing implants like uh, total knee or total hip joint replacements. So basically medical devices failure and malfunctions often relate to processes or problems occurring at, at the interfaces of these, of these applications, including, for example, excessive wear, tribal corrosion, fretting, loosening of the implants, and so on. Um, so therefore, the biological behavior of such, such systems plays a crucial role in prolong prolonging the, the safe and um, reliable uh, operation of the medical devices. In this regard, 2D materials are also attractive for many biomedical and biotribological applications because of their, as we previously saw, unique physical, chemical, and structural properties, as well as the tunable surface chemistry. Um, generally, they tend to be biocompatible. Uh, they're or said to they're said to have like an antibacterial, antiviral activity and non-toxicity. Um, the usage of 2D materials can be divided into three main approaches, uh, the deposition of protective coatings, 
the introduction as fillers in, in composites and the usage of uh, as additives in, in fluids. And all approaches can potentially be, be used for biotropological applications and have their specific advantages depending on, on the application requirements. However, what we can state is that vaccines have very rarely been studied in a bio or not have not been studied in a biotropological context so far. So we recently fabricated maxine reinforced ultra high molecular weight polyethylene um, disc with the aim of enhancing, for example, the biotropological behavior of load bearing implants, such as total knee replacements. The compass, uh, the, or the maxine powder, uh, the, the uh, PE powder was, uh, was mixed with the synthesized maxine powder filled into um, press molds and melted and then pressed into shape. Um, under uh, pressure and vacuum conditions, and thereby we varied the concentration of maxines. Uh, we had like a reference case without maxines and uh, one and two uh, weight percent uh, maxines. And besides uh, structural and um, mechanical properties, we also investigated the biotropological behavior using a pin on disk tribometer, as we can see in the animation on the right. So basically, as, as a counter body, uh, we used cobalt chromium alloy uh, pins as because they're like this gold standard for femoral components of, of knee replacements. The contact we can see here was lubricated with bovine calf serum as a substitute uh, synovial fluid, and the test chamber was uh, tempered to 37 degrees Celsius, representing human body temperature. And the contact conditions were chosen in such a way that they kind of reflected or were representative um, for wear critical conditions of uh, knee replacements. So some results are displayed, uh, displayed on this slide. Um, on the left, uh, we can see uh, indentation hardness and indentation uh, modulus. Um, so actually the influence of the, uh, due to the addition of vaccines is not very distinct, uh, which principally aligns also well with uh, previous results, for example, from Chang et al um, on, on uh, titanium carbide vaccines in polyethylene metrics. Uh, so we only observed a slight increase uh, with higher vaccine content. Um, which can be explained by the high strength of the vaccines, as well as the assumption that the surface terminations of uh, the uh, TI3 uh, C2TX partially cross-linked with um, the polyethylene change, leading to an increased cross-link density in, in the composites. And this interaction reduces the mobility of, of the polymer chains at the interfaces, which also leads to change in the mechanical properties. But as I said, this would for the study concentration is not, was not very distinct. The average uh, friction coefficients that are plotted in the middle uh, suggest that the contact generally operated under kind of mixed to boundary lubrication conditions. And here we observed a slight uh, decrease of friction due to the addition of vaccines. Despite the surface roughness of the vaccine reinforced samples was a bit higher um, because they were kind of harder to, to polish. And what there's also kind of, or not really a difference or distinct difference between uh, the two vaccine concentrations. Um, regarding the wear, however, uh, or the wear coefficient um, of the polymer disc, this, um, the wear rate could be reduced by up to 50% in case of um, yeah, in reinforcing with a two weight percent uh, vaccine concentration. And this is likely to be traced back to, uh, of course, to the low interlayer bonds and easy shearability of the multilayer vaccines, um, as well as the, the ability to form like a wear protective film in the contact area when they're exposed to the, to the rubbing surface. Also the mechanical and higher hardness uh, certainly play a, play a substantial role. And it is expected that the um, that the vaccine re reinforcement promotes the, the, the crystallinity and uh, a more hydrophilic character of the surfaces, which leads to reduced frictional shearing um, due to the lower tendency for degeneration of attached proteins. But it's, at this very moment, we are further qualifying the crystallinity of the composites, the wettability, the wear mechanism, the biocompatibility in terms of uh, cytotoxicity and so on. Um, so there's still a lot to explore in this direction. However, we already saw some potential of reducing, for example, the wear um, of polymeric materials like we have them in, in tibial inlays and thus the risk of associated inflammation or wear particle induced aseptic loosening of the implants. So the last uh, application I want to talk about uh, a bit is in the context of energy harvesting. And <clears throat> 
yeah, technical systems in various industrial sectors and in our daily life uh, experience a trend towards uh, smartification, towards Internet of Things devices, including the integration of miniaturized sensors, actuators, actuators process, and so on. And one of the major challenges um, is the, the energy supply to actually power, power the systems. And this can, for example, be realized by green energy harvesting, whereby small quantities of electrical energy are collected from, from the environment, such as from temperature differences or micro movements in, in so-called nano generators. And thereby several physical effects can be used, for example, piezo electricity, thermal electricity, or uh, photoelectricity. A recent research direction is dedicated towards so-called triboelectric nano generators or abbreviated as tanks, um, which were first introduced by Fanedal in 2012. And since then they have made some tremendous progress and have uh, received a lot of attention in the scientific community. They're particularly attractive to the low cost fabrication, flexibility, easy integration in the systems, and they can operate at pretty low frequencies. Um, yeah, tanks are based on the on the triboelectric effect of, of uh, charging or triboelectric charging of solids. Um, this is basically known for for thousands of years, uh, like from daily life, but uh, can only be can explained by modern state solids or modern solid state physics based on the second uh, term of Maxwell's displacement current. So when two bodies come into contact and sub subsequently they separate again. So this effect is. Um, influence or experience influences by the electron affinity of, of the materials involved in, in the tribal electric series, uh, the configuration, the separation, the temperature, and the surface properties as well. Um, so in tanks, the contacting surface are um, separated from each other by mechanical force, allowing an electric current uh, to, to flow between two electrodes on, on the surface. So the tanks come in four basic modes, including uh, vertical contact separation, which is illustrated on the left-hand side of the slide, um, lateral sliding, single electrode, and also freestanding sliding modes, and the latter is shown on the right-hand side. Um, basically, tanks consist of two materials with different electronegativity and uh, corresponding electrodes. Um, but despite the, the great progress in tanks regarding the configurations, the materials, and so on, their durability under sliding motion, especially, still is one of the major concerns and is directly related to wear behavior of contacting surface. And some surface engineering approaches, such as like the deposition of wear protecting thin films uh, that fulfill the re electrical requirements, but also help to meet the kind of conflicting objectives so to reach a certain electrical output, but also to ensure that the durability of the coatings, of the, of the tanks. So in a, a recent study, we deposited various protecting, wear protecting doped and undoped uh, diamond like carbon uh, coatings, some MOS2 coatings, as well as a uh, Maxine uh, film, which was uh, also uh, titanium carbide based on, and we deposited on the uh, PDFE surface of um, tanks, which is uh, rather prone to, to wear in this application and uh, also limiting uh, the durability of, of tanks. I won't go into too much detail about all the code things um, and what we did, but we basically we analyzed the tribological, uh, triboelectric performance of the tanks uh, operating in contact separation um, against aluminum electrodes and also in freestanding sliding mode. And here we can see the, the voltage, the current, and the charge over time of uh, the PDFE reference, uh, the DLC coated tanks, the MS2 coated ones, and the Maxine um, coated ones. Um, and thus we were able to verify that the Maxine's output or the Maxine's outperformed uh, the other films as well as also the PDFE reference in, in contact summarization mode. And this can be explained by um, or this can be explained by the, the charge accumulation between especially the interlayer sheets as well the existing functional groups, especially uh, oxygen and fluorinite, which helps to gain electrons more easily compared uh, to, the, to the other materials. However, we have to say that we still had some issues with uh, the adhesion of, of the Maxines when we operated in freestanding sliding mode. So um, there's still some, some work to be done in, in that direction. But anyways, we can already see that negative triboelectric maxines can be considered as a promising material because as we know, um, uh, they, they have these um, very good um, wear protecting properties and um, obviously also some 
very good driver electric properties. So we can consider them as a very, very attractive potential uh, material for um, ensuring durability and output of uh, driver electric nano generators. And with this, I'm almost at the end of my talk. I'll just wrap things up really quickly. Uh, what, we did, what did we do today? Uh, we saw that why we should have vaccines on the radar when it comes to sensing the friction and wear performance of various tribological systems. We saw that vaccines can, for example, be applied as thin coatings or as a filler in composite materials to protect the functional surface of various tribological systems ranging from machine elements such as rolling bearings or biometric, uh, biomedical devices uh, like uh, total knee replacements. Uh, up to uh, energy harvesting, for example, uh, using triboelectric nanogenerators. And the vaccine's potential becomes even clearer when we bear in mind the, the theoretically uh, possible and actually uh, synthesized variety of stoichiometric vaccine components, while only TI3S2 mainly was studied in, in more detail uh, in the context of, of tribology so far. So that shall be all from my side. Thanks again, Andreas and Philip, for, for having me. And thanks for everyone for watching. And now I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Max, for the, for the very interesting um, overview about different, um, more or less, vaccine and 2D related uh, topics. Uh, very interesting to see because uh, from a very fundamental talk, we moved to a very uh, application related talk, uh, which I think is very nice uh, for the audience to see the full spectrum of the 2D materials. Um, so there have really been uh, some questions in the chat, um, at least on my side. Uh, so the first one uh, is, did you deposit maxines from water solutions uh, and uh, which etching conditions uh, have you used for maxines? Uh, well, uh, no, we, we drop casted the vaccines act actually uh, from, uh, at least for the bearing applications uh, from, from acetone. And for the nano generators, uh, we used uh, isopropyl alcohol because it's like a little bit aggressive for, for the polymeric, um, the PDE substrate. Um, and the etching conditions, um, yeah, with like just, just the, the, the get very classical uh, etching etching strategy of, of the vaccines uh, using uh, um, yeah using acid exactly the the, the vaccines were either etched uh, with HF or with lithium fluoride and HCl the the standard yes. methods uh, the yes. harsh one and the, but, the the milder one yes yes um, did you deposit delaminated or multi-layer vaccines? I think that's a very interesting uh, question. And if delaminated, did you use uh, lithium chloride or organic intercalants? Yes. Um, the second question will be answered with, with the first one as well. We used multi-layer vaccines. Right. Um, yeah, there, there are some like pioneering studies uh, looking at the different tribological behavior of, of um, like few layer or um, single layer vaccines compared to multi layers, but um, I guess Andreas confirmed that actually the the multi layer ones seem to be uh, quite beneficial uh, in terms of of tribological properties. Well, um, I think it always depends on the system, I believe, right? Uh, and if you look at uh, at nano scale or macro scale or micro scale, at least at the mi micro macro scale, uh, according to my or to our experiences, that the multi layer uh, vaccines work better than the few layers. Uh, and we believe that this has something to do related to the degradation that happens uh, during rubbing uh, due to the thermomechanical impact. Um, but this might change in the in the nano scale uh, doing A of M. Uh, yeah. Experiments, uh, but at least for for macro scale, um, yeah. the multi layers was better. Might, might also be like a, a total different story when it comes to different vaccines. So so far, right. there's not right. about a lot knowledge about about the other the other options. No, this this just holds true for titanium three carbon two. Yes. Um, can you list some substrate names for <laughs> nano generators? Um, easy to fabricate in the beginning. Yeah, well, um, probably the one of the most used uh, um, combinations right now is uh, PDFE rubbing against, uh, for example, an, an aluminium electrode. Right. Um, so this is this is one of the most common configurations, but there's a wide variety of what has been done. Um, but also because it was one of, or it is one of the, the 
yeah, most common um, and most accepted um, yeah, combinations, uh, we try to, to address this combination by applying the protective coatings on the PDFE. Uh, there have been some studies like on applying um, or um, yeah, making reinforced, for example, aluminum or coating the aluminum, but in our opinion, it is, it is important to protect the PDFE from, from wearing. All right. Because normally you use very very thin um, PDFE films, or it's basically it's just it's just adhesive tape actually uh, that you use for it, and it was quite quite tricky um, to deposit the coatings with a with a thickness of a few micron on a on a PDFE tape that itself has also only a thickness of fifty micron. Right. Yes, there was some. Processing development involved. Right? Yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah, a lot of work has been done with, on that with the, the colleagues from from Erlang and Beirut, and I think some of them are in the in the audience right. here as well. So greetings. <laughs> okay, so um, I don't know. Um, there would be also the possibility if there are more questions related to the talk of Diana. Um, please uh, feel free to ask either via the chat or just uh, open the microphone and um, you can interact directly with both speakers. Hi. Uh, hi, can I uh, ask some questions? Please go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, so you mentioned somewhere about uh, uh, friction less uh, and it, it, uh, it produces like uh, less friction for the if you are applying this uh, MX and stuff. So how does it actually? How much uh, is there any data you have that it, it reduces from some other like uh, an ESO or something that you can like um, compare or something? I'm I'm not quite sure if I totally understood the question. Uh, I think it was related to um, to how much of the of the vaccines, for example, we have to apply to to the components to effectively effectively reduce friction. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Um, well, there are, there so far there are quite little studies uh, on on these aspects. For example, on on the thickness of of the um, of the coating we have to apply. Um, or on, on the uh, concentration of vaccines as, as fillers and composites. Regarding, um, regarding the coatings for solid lubrication or solid lubrication of machine elements, for example, um, there, typical, or there are some typical models to, for example, calculate the surface or estimate the surface life uh, for, for such components, which is uh, most of the time directly related to, to the volume of the materials um, being actually in, in the contact and being able to, to be consumed, uh, so to say, but they were de mainly developed for, for MS2. Um, so we, we have to see if, if adding like a thicker coating um, of, of the vaccines would increase uh, the service life uh, further or of, if there are any other effects maybe um, that, that might even deteriorate the, the uh, tropological performance. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, there's another question coming up. What is your thought on the uh, on the potential of vaccines for thermoelectric applications? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I'm definitely not an expert in, in thermoelectric <laughs> applications, um, but but of course, um, vaccines have have a wide spectrum of of amazing mechanical, electrical, thermal properties. Um, so there's a, a wide variety of, of applications uh, where you can apply them. And of course, um, the development of vaccines um, came to, to a large part more from or was driven by, by uh, electro um, or catalysis applications, for example. So there's, there's still a lot to, to explore in that direction. Right. I would agree on that. Excellent. So, do you have any more questions that went personally to to your chats? Maybe. No, I didn't detect any. Yeah, I think if not, I think um, 
we are basically uh, done with the webinar. So uh, I would like to thank Diana and also Max for the both very interesting uh, talks, one from the more fundamental side, the other very much from the application side, which was very interesting and a very nice couple today. Uh, in the end, I would like to uh, thank the audience for joining us today. Uh, special thanks go, go to all the, the sponsors, which is Art Tech Instruments from the industrial side, um, the two MDPI journals, uh, Coatings and Lubricants, as well as Frontiers in Mechanical Engineering. So soon we're going to send the next uh, reminder for the upcoming webinar. Uh, I believe that in May we're going to have a little break because of conference time uh, and we will be traveling, uh, Philip and I, so we will be back with the next webinar in June. And then we will have Ani Suman from Argon National Lab, uh, who will also shed some more light uh, on other solid lubricant coatings um, um, based on 2D materials. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much for the nice presentations. Uh, stay safe and healthy and have a pleasant weekend. Thank you. Thank Take you care. all. Bye-bye. We also invite you to submit your research to three current special issues in coatings, lubricants, or frontiers in mechanical engineering. You can find the links to the special issues in the comment section below the video. Introducing the most advanced universal tribometer, the MFT-5000. With a modular architecture platform design, it is a robust surface testing instrument engineered to evaluate friction, wear, mechanical properties of materials, as well as lubricants over time. The MFT-5000's open XYZ stages and wide range of interchangeable modules and sensors allows users to self-implement and add-on customization and combine several tribology tools all on one device. These diverse modules accomplish various motions for any application and are capable of speeds from 10,000 RPM to 500 Hz oscillation. The complement sensors achieve millinewton to 12,000 newton wide force range with options of strain gauge, piezo, and capacitive multi-dimension force sensors. The lambda profilometer, combined with the patented inline design, coincide to analyze any surface, including glass, with ease. Because of its unique four imaging modes, the profilometer produces 3D information by creating sub-nanometer surface images automatically. A fully automated and simple software interface integrates the data, enabling researchers to design and conduct tests at nano, micro, and macro levels. To simulate real-life scenarios, the tribometer comes with several environmental control options that allows testing minus 120 to 1200 degrees Celsius temperatures. These interchangeable chambers are skilled in evaluating high pressure, vacuum, humidity, salt spray, and tribo-corrosion conditions. Due to its multiple possible configurations, the MFT-5000 is used extensively across a wide range of industries, including oil, biomedical, semiconductor, coatings, automotive, electronics, materials, aerospace, and many more. On this platform, all types of tribology tests are possible. Our tech instruments, leading innovation in tribology and surface test instrumentation. <laughs>